Welcome from the First Presbyterian Church in Burbank. We're glad you're here. Let's join the service now and hear the proclaiming of God's Word. The text is we're going through the passage. We're going on a series of Jesus coming toward the cross. And as we're doing this series, we, we're looking at his interactions with people. And we see in our passage today, Jesus seeing a man who's uh, blind and healing him. John chapter 9, please turn with me. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 12, though the story is the whole chapter. And I encourage you to read this later on as you see the interaction Jesus has and, uh, with the man who's been healed and then the man who's been healed in his interaction with the religious leaders. Listen to the word of the Lord. This is Jesus. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means, the word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you bow with me in prayer? God, as we read this passage, there's so much to this passage. So many things are being told to us. So in a way, Lord, as you open the eyes of the blind man, open our eyes this morning to see what this means and why it's important for us and how we go around to proclaim the great name of Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Bless us. Open our eyes, Holy Spirit. Draw us together in a spiritual sense, though we may be separate from one, one another and in the seats, but also in live stream. Bring us together as one church that we might glorify you and lift high the name that is above all names, Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. As Jesus and his disciples walked along, they came to a man who was blind. The disciples then asked a question. Did you hear it? Lord, why is this man blind? Did he sin or did his parents sin? That's a strange question, isn't it? Yet somehow we identify with it because even within us, we always want to find out who's to blame. Whose fault is this? I know within myself, that's usually the first question I ask is, all right, who messed up? Who did this? Who caused it? But did you know what Jesus does? He avoids that question and he, he, just, he answers the question saying no. But God's going to get the glory. What we learn in life is this. We, especially in religion, want to find out the cause and the reason for why things are the way they are. But sometimes, friends, we just don't know. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes good things happen to bad people. That's just the way life is. There's sometimes not a karmic principle in fact, Jesus, what we notice about him that's different than the disciples is they want to find out, all right, who's to blame? Why did this happen? And Jesus wants to fix the problem. Some people always look for blame in everything. Jesus wants to solve the problem. I think of all the qualities of Jesus. Among them, that quality is one that I love, is that we always want to uh, judge and blame and Jesus wants to fix and save he loved this man the most amazing thing about the passage and many miss it is what is being said about Jesus here not only his compassion but who he is you see if we were to follow up from the story before and, and I think Casey preached on this last Sunday this is a story of Jesus arguing with the religious leaders and they with him who are you 
And Jesus is telling them who he is. But in John chapter 8, he makes it very clear. I am who I am. Or as we read it, ego in me, I am in the Greek, which is Yahweh in the Hebrew. And we know that Jesus made that declaration because the religious leaders then pick up stones to stone him to death for daring to blaspheme and call himself the God who created all things. And so we see that that they believe him to be a blasphemer because Jesus makes a powerful declaration. He is God come to earth. Remember Yahweh, I am who I am. That was the voice of the burning bush that came from the burning bush when Moses said, who are you? And God said, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. I was who I was. Existence. This is the claim Jesus is now making for himself. And why is that important? Because the miracle we read today follows from the declaration that he made in chapter 8. That's why it's really weird when we see the miracle he does by spitting on the ground and making clay. We find in the Gospel of John that there are are important messages. We, We read in the synoptic gospel, synoptic, together seeing, optic, synoptic gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that whenever Jesus does a miracle, the word that's used there is dunamis in Greek, which means explosion, power. We get the word dynamite from it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke say Jesus did powerful miracles, dunamis. John avoids that word, and in his gospel, he says Jesus did signs, samea. We note that John will say at the end of his book, oh, if if I could write down everything that Jesus did, the books of the world could not contain them. But in his gospel, he wants to tell you about seven miracles, samea, signs. This is who Jesus is. Look at those miracles, it declares that Jesus is God come to earth. We, for for instance, let me just go through them very uh, quickly, and I wish we had hours to talk about each different, each of the one, each miracle. These were, the seven miracles were the things the gods were supposed to do, the ancient gods, and if they came to earth, this is how you'd know they'd come to earth, but they never came, they never worked out because they don't exist. But the early church could say, we got the guy who did the things the ancient gods were supposed to do when they came to earth. The first miracle is he changed water into wine. In the ancient world, Bacchus or Dionysus, whatever you call him, this god was the god of pleasure. And if Bacchus showed up, water would become wine. But he never showed up. The temples of Bacchus in the ancient world had Um, bowls filled with water and and if they ever turn to wine then we know Bacchus appeared but he doesn't show up because the God of pleasure in their minds doesn't exist then Jesus shows up what does he do turns water into wine what is that a sign the God of pleasure has come to earth a second miracle Jesus heals an official son and we note The God who's supposed to heal by speaking words in the ancient world didn't come to earth. Where was Gaia? Zeus. Where were the Egyptian gods Serapis or Imhotep? They were the ones who could speak words of healing, but they didn't show up. Jesus did, and he spoke to the the official that his son would be healed, and just by saying the words, the same time of day he said it, that boy was healed. The servant. The third miracle is Jesus healed a man who was paralyzed at Bethesda? John chapter 5. And we ask the question, where was the god Apollo or Asclepius, the gods of healing of the Greek and Roman world? They didn't show up. Jesus did. The fourth miracle, Jesus fed people. He fed people, 5,000 people. Well, 5,000 at least, perhaps more than that showed up and they were hungry and Jesus took bread and he blessed it and broke it and when he passed it out now everybody ate bread and fish where were the gods of the harvest in the ancient world they didn't show up Ceres Demeter number five Jesus walked on the water wait a minute that's the sign of Poseidon or Neptune who is the master of the water but he didn't show up Jesus showed up and he walked on water And all the way through this, it's as if John is trying to tell you, 
you don't need to believe in the gods. They, are not, they don't exist. They can't offer you hope. They can't do anything for you. But Jesus can. And he came to earth. We touched him. We felt him. The seventh miracle, then we'll come back to the sixth, which is in our passage. The seventh miracle, we see Jesus there at the tomb of Lazarus, and he calls Lazarus forth from the tomb. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb, and everyone's shocked. Who could do such a thing? Who has the power of the resurrection with him? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they were dead, yet shall they live. Those who live and believe in me will never die. And we ask the questions, where was Mithra, the Persian god, or Pluto, or Hades, or the gods of the afterlife? Where, who, where was Anubis, the Egyptian god of the underworld? They never showed up. Nobody rose from the dead until Jesus comes. Because in all of these signs, that's why they're called signs, they point to Jesus being the fulfillment of all things. He truly is Yahweh, existence, the one who was and is and is to come. He is life. And now we come to the sixth miracle, though we've already talked about the seventh. And this miracle, this sign, is the man who's born blind. And in this miracle, we find something very interesting. We might ask the question, why in the world would Jesus spit on the ground and make clay? Because of what he just said in John chapter 8. He said, I am Yahweh. What do we learn? Yahweh made humans out of clay. And the Hebrew word Adam, Adam. So when Jesus spit on the ground and made the mud, it is as if he's looking at the religious leaders saying, you didn't believe me, watch this. And he put the mud on the man's eyes, Adam. And he had eyes. He could see. You see, it's very important that we know the claim of Jesus is that he is God. He is Yahweh. John 1, verses 1 through 3, tell us the very thing. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Who is it that created all things? The Word. Who is the Word? God come to earth. Who is God come to earth? Jesus. He is the one who was and is and is to come. He is existence. In fact, that's what he makes the claim in the book of Revelation before he returns. He says, I am the one who was and is and is to come. Powerful. What I see in the passage, though, as we look deep into the words and the theology, what I see is such a beautiful and tender thing. Because while we can go deep, then I wish we could talk more and more about this and even what the implications are of what Jesus says and his claim that actually put him on the cross. But what I love about this text is that Jesus is giving a sign to the religious leaders. They won't believe him because they cannot see though a blind man will see, not just with his eyes, but with his spirit. What I love about it is this, as Jesus walked along, he saw a man who was blind, and he went over to him. Because Jesus sees, and he notices. Where many people would disregard a poor beggar who was born blind, Jesus saw him. It's so easy in our lives, friends, to think that Jesus doesn't know us or see us. He sees everything about you and he's madly in love with you. And when you feel like a poor, blind beggar, a leper, perhaps, he sees you and he wants to heal you. Oh, I love the passage in the Gospels where Jesus encounters a man with leprosy and the man says, Jesus, if you can you can make me whole. And Jesus says, I will. And he touched the man. Be made whole. And he was. Because he's not afraid to meet us, whoever we are, however we feel about ourselves. He loves us. In other words, I can almost see as these disciples are asking the question, which the man could hear. They'd forgotten that. Who sinned, this man or his parents? It's as if Jesus said, stop. This is a child of God. 
He's a human being. He's been hurting all these years. I'm going to fix him. You can blame whatever you want. I'm going to take care of this. And how precious it is that Jesus took the poor beggar who'd been blind all of his life and treated him as if he'd been fearfully and wonderfully made. I can imagine the face of Jesus as he spit upon the ground and made the clay with his hand and put it on the man's eyes as if Adam, Adam, was being made again. The crowning creation of God, humankind, Adam and Eve. Now he's taken someone who was insignificant and, and, and making him alive. Because this man was made fearfully and wonderfully. You see, that's how God makes everyone. Fearfully and wonderfully. I love what Nikki read for us a few moments ago about Psalm 139, written by David, the great psalmist, the great king, the great shepherd in the Old Testament. Listen to the words again, and while I say these words, be thinking about your own life. This is how God thinks of you, even as David now is responding to God. Oh God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. Your eyes, you saw me. All the days ordained for me were written in your book even before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. The profound words of David who understood the love of God that was everlasting. Even in the 23rd Psalm, and I shall live in the house of the Lord forever. It was a declaration that wherever he goes, God is with him. Wherever he could go. Where can I go from your spirit? If I flee to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the grave, you're there. But notice he even says in Psalm 139 if I, that, that, that if I took the grains of sand, your thoughts are more than them. You ever gone to the beach and reached down and grabbed the grains of sand and looked at them and tried to count the grains of sand in your hand? Have you ever looked at the beach and tried to wonder how many grains of sand are at the beach? Or, or, or thought to your mind, in your mind that all the grains of the sand and all the oceans of the world, it's innumerable. Yet David says, and I hope you hear this, your thoughts, O oh God, toward me are more than the grains of sand. You could easily say, well, it's just kind of an idiom or maybe it's just a, uh, a tool of poetry. No, it's not. It's real. God thinks about you constantly more than the grains of the sand in all the world. Friends, you've been made fearfully and wonderfully by a God who loves you so very much. And Jesus would see a blind beggar as a beautiful creation of God. He was given eyes to see, and what we find in the text is something even more beautiful, that this man, who knows nothing about theology, now will go before the religious leaders, and they'll ask him, how did this happen? Well, Jesus, this man came, and he spit on the ground and made mud in my eye. And I could hear the religious leaders scowling at them. What do you mean, made mud? Is he truly proclaiming to be the one he just said he was in John 8? Yahweh? Yes, he is. They don't believe him. They call his parents to come and answer him. We don't trust him. What about you? What do you say? They said, well, he's old enough. You can trust him. The man actually turns to them, and this man, uneducated, becomes the teacher of the teachers. Oh, you want to follow this Jesus? I'll tell you. Because Jesus had opened his eyes. And when Jesus opens your eyes, you see clearly you see, because in this text, what we find is the one who cannot see, and Jesus makes him see, can see all things, and he can actually see it before. And the ones who proclaimed to have their eyes open couldn't see it all. They could only see with their physical eyes. 
not the spiritual ones. Jesus, open our eyes. Open our eyes to two great things. Number one, that Jesus is powerful. He's Almighty God. Once we know who He is, then we can begin to understand who we are. Can't have it the other way. It doesn't work. We get confused. If we focus too much on ourselves, we get confused. Once we know that God is powerful and that God is for us and that God loves us and that we've been fearfully and wonderfully made, then we begin to see things the way they are. Then we no longer fear for the things that might be or could be because we know God is for us, that God loves us. And the more we focus on this Jesus, the more we understand the things that God does. The Apostle Peter, you might remember, one day he saw Jesus walking on the water. And Peter says, Lord, I, I want to do that too. I said, come on out, Peter. And Peter got out of the boat and he walked upon the water. And as long as he looked at Jesus, he could stand on that water. But the fears came up. The wind and the waves. And he turned away from Jesus and looked at them. And he began to sink. And Jesus pulled him up. As long as our eyes are not fixed upon Jesus, we will be afraid and we're going to feel like we're sinking. That has truth for us even in the days of this coronavirus. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. We've got to look to him. And why would we want to look elsewhere? Who loves us like he does? Who? Once we see the beauty of who he is, how could we take our eyes away? There was a man named John Newton. In 1779, he wrote a beautiful hymn called Amazing Grace. You know his history. He was a slave trader. He pulled people away from their families and murdered people, perhaps. And John Newton, at the end of his life, wrote the song about what a wretch of a man he'd been. He repented and felt horrible for the things he had done. But listen to these words. Listen to them again because he speaks of a truth that, that, that can only happen when we allow the grace of God to come into our lives and open our eyes. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear "'and grace my fears relieved. "'How precious did that grace appear "'the hour I first believed. "'Through many dangers, toils, and snares.'" You ever gone through dangers, toils, and snares? Perhaps you're going through them now. "'I've already come. "'Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, "'and grace will lead me home. "'The Lord has promised good to me, "'to you as well.'" His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Yea, when this flesh and heart shall fail and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. This is a life of relationship with God who is a powerful God, a mighty God who will be with us through the trials and fires and waters when they seem to overcome us. But as we walk with God, we begin to note that we're loved. We've been fearfully and wonderfully made. And when our eyes open to those two things, we begin to understand, hey, you know what? It's gonna be okay. Jesus is with us. It's going to be okay. Keep our eyes fixed upon him. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you love us more than we could ever begin to imagine. We thank you that you have made us fearfully and wonderfully. Knit us together in our mother's womb that, that you walk all the days with us. You, you are there with us. Where can we go from your spirit? Where can we flee from your presence? Nowhere. Help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you, the author and finisher of our faith, the author and finisher of our lives. You're there when life begins. You're there when life ends. You're there for all eternity with us. 
Bless us, Lord. Open our eyes to see this, that we would never fear. Even as you said, do not be afraid. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Bless us, Lord, to be a blessing to this world and a blessing to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope this service has been a blessing to you. We also invite you to join us to worship in person on Sunday mornings. We have services at 9.15 and 11.15. Thank you for watching, and may God bless you.